So hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming out to the Nation Rising Online Assembly. My name is Howard Nye, and I'm an organizer of the Nation Rising Alberta chapter, and I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Alberta. And we're so glad you could make it here and that we could have this event online. Yeah, so we're a grassroots nonpartisan political advocacy group that is seeking to bring together individuals, experts, and organizers across Canada who are concerned about the environment, health, and animals to demand that the government switch the multi-billion dollar subsidies that it currently has going to prop up the animal agriculture industry to instead finance the just transition to a plant-based food system. So our demands in particular are to stop the multi-billion dollar subsidies that are going to support animal agriculture in Canada. Our view as I'm gonna briefly elaborate on here, is that our tax dollars should not be used to fund food that makes us sick, destroys the planet, and unnecessarily harms animals. The second is to make healthy plant-based food affordable to all Canadians by creating new subsidies to support the production and availability of this healthy plant-based food, especially to low-income Canadians and members of indigenous communities. And finally, to help farmers transition to plant-based farming by providing them with other forms of financial and logistical support to enable them to do so. So I think that the present moment makes it very clear that Canada really needs to transition to a plant-based food system. And various of our speakers are gonna be elaborating on elements of this, but I'm just gonna say something briefly today about the present moment. So the first is the context of public health. So as many of you may know, Canada had a new food guide come out in 2019, which was new in that it followed scientific research on diet and health rather than food industry lobbying. And it recommended a much more plant-based diet. So its first guideline, primary guideline, was that vegetables, fruit, and whole grains uh, should be consumed regularly and protein foods should be consumed regularly. And among protein foods, folks should consume more plant-based. Uh, the guideline was recommending the shift to plant-based foods and away from animal products because among other things, animal products are linked to very serious health problems like cardiovascular disease and certain cancers, which are two of the leading causes of death and two of the leading costly diet-related chronic conditions in Canada. Uh, but the present moment, I think, also makes very clear another set of public health reasons to stop supporting ag animal agriculture and facilitate a transition to a plant-based food system, which is that producing animal products at scale inevitably involves crowding animals together in sheds, feedlots, and places of slaughter, and typically involves crowding the human workers together in slaughterhouses, uh, doing very hot, stressful, dangerous, dangerous jobs, uh, and, you know, these conditions are ripe for spreading and incubating pandemics. So animal agriculture also, another pandemic relevant aspect of this is that animal agriculture requires enormous amounts of land and is thus chiefly responsible for human encroachment on wild animal territories. And all of this together makes animal agriculture uh, a near perfect mechanism for the incubation and spread of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. So over 80% uh, of antibiotics in Canada are given to farmed animals and store-bought meat contains superbugs and infections being common in, in animal uh, and, and antibiotic resistant bacterial infections being common in animal ag workers and those living near concentrated animal feeding operations. While the, and while the exact origins, for example, of COVID-19 are uncertain, it's very likely that, confi that the confinement of farmed animals and animal agriculture related encroachment on wild animal habitat played key roles in its passing from bats to an intermediate host to humans as in SARS and MERS before it. And as we've uh, seen some reporting, uh, slaughterhouses have unfortunately been epicenters of COVID-19 transmission among humans. Okay, and that of course brings us to the environmental, so to other forms of environmental concerns. So animal agriculture is an inherently inefficient way to obtain nutrients, uh, growing crops to feed to animals and then eating the animals' bodies and secretions, wastes an enormous amount of energy relative to eating plants directly. Um, and uses vastly more land and water and generates vastly more polluting waste, including greenhouse gases. So by conservative estimates, animal agriculture produces more greenhouse gases than all transportation exhaust combined and is a leading destroyer of carbon sinks because it's such a la uh, land intensive operation. Um, and then finally, there's concern for the farmed animals themselves. So recent surveys show that 95% of Canadians want to reduce needless animal suffering, including that of farmed animals, to the point that 
um, of Canadians actually support stronger legislation to protect animals. But uh, in it, uh, um, perhaps because cruelty is such an inherent part of large-scale animal agriculture, um, there have been attempts to protect business as usual by passing likely unconstitutional ag gag laws, uh, which Anita was just talking about, Bill 156 in Ontario, also Bill 27 in Alberta, to inhibit the ability of activists to document the conditions of farmed animals. Um, so many Canadian consumers have been, uh, you know, also more recently shocked by the euthanasia of farmed animals due to COVID-19 induced supply chain issues to the point that a recent survey found that a majority of Canadians actually thought this kind of wasteful killing should be illegal. Uh, especially because animal agriculture is the opposite of necessary for health and the environment, uh, and all farmed animal suffering and killing is thus in a clear sense needless and wasteful. The best solution seems clearly to be to get Canada out of the animal big agriculture business altogether. Um, so unfortunately, despite all these features of animal agriculture, the Canadian government is still using a lot of our tax dollars to prop it up uh, and support it in other ways. So first of all, the Canadian government is uh, making direct payments and grants to animal agriculture. So the Hill Times estimated, found that at least 1.9 billion went at, in direct payments and grants went to animal agriculture just in January through August of 2019, with a whopping 1.79 billion of that going to the dairy industry alone. Um, there's also compensatory payments and bailouts. So recently, the 2019-2020 budget set aside $3.65 billion in compensatory payments for trade deals and losses from selling production rights in the supply-managed system to animal agriculture uh, firms, large-scale firms, and at least uh, $922 million uh, in bailouts from, uh, to, to animal agriculture from economic damage due to COVID-19. Um, also, as I mentioned, there is the supply managed system, which is basically the government running a publicly enforced cartel for the animal agriculture industry. So supply management functions as a publicly enforced cartel that limits the production and importation of dairy, eggs, and poultry, and enables producers to profit at the expense uh, of consumers from selling these products. And the burden of this is estimated to fall largely on the poor. Um, the estimated gain to supply managed industries uh, from this system is, you know, moderately 2.9 billion in total, with 2.6 billion coming from the dairy industry alone. Uh, and it seems here that a much better solution would be to help consumers access healthy plant-based proteins than to continue helping the supply managed animal industries benefit at the expense of the consumers. But um, there have been some hopeful signs of change. Uh, in the past few months, Nation Rising supporters have sent out over 7,000 letters to MPs across uh, Canada asking them to start funding a shift to a plant-based food system. And just this week, Justin Trudeau actually did announce uh, $100 million in new funding uh, to help finance plant-based protein production. So I think it's actually a great start, uh, but we really need to keep the pressure on. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our fir first invited speaker, Randall Abate. Randall is a is professor and endowed chair in marine and environmental law and policy at Monmouth University, and also serves as director of the Institute for Global Understanding at Monmouth. Randall is cur uh, currently teaches courses in domestic and international environmental law, climate justice, animal law, and constitutional law at Monmouth. Prior to joining Monmouth in 2018, Randall had 24 years of full-time law teaching experience at six U.S. law schools. Randall is author of Climate Change and the Voiceless, Protecting Future Generations, Wildlife and Natural Resources with Cambridge University Press out in 2019, and editor of What Can Animal Law Learn from Environmental Law, second edition with Environmental Law Institute Press 2020. So with that, Randall, uh, thanks so much for joining us and please take it away. Thank you so much, Howard. So this is just a quick roadmap. Um, the uh, destructive legacy, from, from my perspective, some of the ones that get overlooked are, are ones that I wanted to touch on briefly here. The impacts to neighboring communities is getting a lot of attention lately from a legal perspective. There have been a, a lot more lawsuits in the US uh, filed on public nuisance grounds uh, against large animal agriculture facilities, and those are making some progress. Um, and, and those impacts to neighboring communities are often overlooked. So it's a good uh, development for these uh, lawsuits to be gaining momentum 
Um, and there's a great documentary that just came out that I plan to view very soon. It's called The, the Right to Harm, uh, pl play on words on the right to farm. Uh, and, it, and it covers these, uh, uh, the, these lawsuits, these impacts to the, the communities that are uh, near these, these large animal agriculture facilities. Um, and from my perspective as an environmental uh, law professor, the, the environmental impacts are, are simply daunting. And so I, I wanna share with you a, a slide that have, has some of this information just on one dimension. Um, we, we've heard about how um, animal agriculture is certainly a major contributor to climate change, that uh, major uh, emissions of greenhouse gases from, from these facilities are, are a significant contributor to global climate change. They're very land intensive, which is bad for many reasons uh, it, with respect to climate change and in terms of the, the pollution, the impacts to local communities. Um, and certainly this, this uh, set of statistics talks about the, how water intensive uh, and, and how that feature alone is, is tragic, uh, how, how much water, and, and remember, we're not just facing a global, global hunger crisis, we're also facing a glo global water, uh, fresh water access crisis. So uh, this reason alone makes factory farms uh, hopefully the, the, the number one enemy in many people's minds. And, and ultimately, this slide also conveys this, this core reality about how this embrace of large-scale factory farming is is fundamentally a, a human rights problem, that, that it is so fundamentally inefficient to grow crops, to feed animals, to who are then tormented and slaughtered for consumption. It's the ultimate inefficiency. If anyone's watching us from outer space, they, they must be laughing at our food system, how, how grossly inefficient and unjust all of this is on so many levels. So federal subsidies uh, make that worse. So in defense of federal subsidies, when we look at both fossil fuel or animal agriculture, they, they had some purpose initially that, that wasn't terrible. Uh, on the fossil fuel side, subsidies were designed to promote energy independence, avoid reliance on foreign sources of oil. That's, that's a, a, a challenging diplomatic issue. So that much made sense. Um, but ultimately, that was uh, something that didn't need to go on for, for almost a century. We, we are uh, in the US and in Canada, largely energy independent, and we didn't need the government to be pumping in billions of dollars to, to prop up fossil fuel when it is fossil fuels in large part that are uh, causing us to spiral toward catastrophe on the climate change issue. So on the animal agriculture side, this was much more of uh, what, what we're seeing in some ways in the, the COVID situation now, that there's a, a, a problem in supply uh, there, there's, there's disruptions in, in uh, supply chains and ultimately the government intervened in the Great Depression years in the U.S. to ensure this balance of supply and demand, avoiding oversupply, and so subsidies were involved in that appropriate purpose. But again, they, they kept supporting agriculture well beyond the need, and for decades it's been a matter of the government um, essentially propelling the production of cheap meat. And of course, the expression goes, there's no such thing as a free lunch or even a cheap lunch. And so what we have now are these grossly underpriced uh, products from animal agriculture, getting a fast food meal uh, for $5. And those, those costs are imposed on the public in the form of externalities. We have a massive public health burden from that subsidizing of unhealthy food that's raised in, in inappropriate um, circumstances in these factory farms, and, and certainly the environmental impact is extraordinary by, by promoting that form of production. The, the, the public is bearing that cost as well. So that's really the, the way of characterizing subsidies is this notion of adding insult to injury. E even leaving large-scale agriculture on its own, it's, it's going to be incredibly harmful, but when the federal government stands behind it and promotes this fierce tailwinds to move it forward at the expense of society. This is absolutely ha has to come to an end immediately if we have any hopes of a sustainable future. And, and I think as, as Howard mentioned, COVID-19 is, is a bit of a, a moment in time for us to evaluate this need for a fundamental transition in our society that in the US, not surprisingly in the Trump administration, an immediate reaction to COVID was to further prop up animal agriculture rather than seeing an opportunity to transition away from it. And so it's really at, at this idea of 
characterizing what this really stands for, federal government supporting something that is actively devastating to society as a whole. And labeling it in terms that grab attention, I think is a good advocacy tool. Um, I'm referring to it as a, a weapon of mass destruction. That, that certainly got a lot of people's attention diplomatically when the US was trying to hunt down WMDs in, in Iraq um, and, and certainly was able to get a lot of political will behind that. How about supporting these WMDs on your own soil and killing your own people? I mean, that, that's gotta be the ultimate uh, in, inappropriate role of government, that, that government is promoting the, the, the destruction of its own people by subsidizing these operations. And, and there was a provocative characterization from a prime minister in a, a low-lying Pacific island a few years ago in the climate change negotiations that was quite compelling in this regard, that that prime minister characterized the Western worlds, the, the advanced democracies of, of the West and their failure to regulate climate change as an insidious form of terrorism against us. And, and that's a provocative statement, but a largely true one. It's just how it was framed is something that can often turn the tide in, in public dialogue, that if, if the Western nations started to think about that harder, perhaps it might motivate a, a, a retooling of our policies on climate change, because in fact, a failure to do everything we can is in fact uh, terrorism against these nations that are doomed to, to go underwater in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, so as far as promoting a, tr a just transition, we're looking at an addiction pattern, both with fossil fuels and with animal ag, that, that is quite parallel, uh, that we, we have a foundation of a reliance on fossil fuels that is supported by uh, government subsidies in the US and Canada. And then we see baby steps toward cleaner versions of that problematic reliance, which is better than nothing, but really not where we need to be in 2020. And ultimately we need to be in that third box as soon as possible and government has tools to get us there, to facilitate that transition. Europe is a great model for this. It, it doesn't have to happen naturally in the market. Government should take its stewardship role seriously and facilitate that transition rather than deepening us into the, into the addiction of, uh, on fossil fuels. And we look at animal agriculture and the same thing is happening, that ultimately the subsidies are deepening our addiction, that's already a bad thing, and very incremental efforts to transition away and try to support local, smaller scale uh, animal agriculture is certainly far better than subsidizing large scale animal agriculture, but we really need to get to the third box immediately, again, with the, the pandemic society, the climate change existential threat we face more every day. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has really given us about a decade to get this right in terms of mitigation measures. So I don't know when we're going to wake up and realize this is an emergency every day that we wake up. Um, so federal subsidies are a potential tool to promote good. And, and government always has the opportunity to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. So there are some examples certainly throughout Europe about promoting this this transition. Uh, Germany has pledged to eliminate all coal-fired power plants by 2030, I believe. Um, and, and even in the U.S. at the state level, um, the, the Colorado governor recently engaged with its department, his Department of Agriculture in Colorado to encourage the production of plant-based uh, products because this is where we're headed. And let's get Colorado in that market and, and uh, and certainly uh, serve the Colorado economy and its people by doing so. Um, and that's just one small step, but that's what governments can and should do. And so uh, a, a bill in the US to promote climate friendly farming, very easy to do, it's the right thing to do. Why can't we see more of these initiatives that government propels us toward a better path instead of uh, entrenching our addictions to bad things. And uh, this is popular in Europe, but certainly hasn't caught on in the US, a carbon tax on beef. Beef is certainly the supreme culprit when we talk about the dangers of, of factory farm uh, meats, that it's the most uh, greenhouse gas intensive, water intensive, land intensive product. And so we can't next week say beef is prohibited. We didn't do that with tobacco either, but we can have government promote heavier burdens on those who make that choice. And that's the way government can work to promote uh, a, a more sustainable future. 
And so with animal agriculture in, in many ways, when we talk about this just transition, is very much like coal. Um, coal was something we relied on. It was the status quo. We didn't second guess it for so long. And even when it was seen to be a significant source of air pollution and respiratory problems in the 70s, 80s, it still remained a primary source of, of, uh, of energy. And then once we got more informed about climate change, it started to get a black hat reputation that ultimately this was something we needed to get away from. And we had so many other options. It was, it was easy to, to, to transition away from coal. Although the, the challenging part is the just transition that we can't just remove all of those jobs that the coal industry workers hold. We, we have to facilitate a transition to a, to a more sustainable form of energy that will be able to employ that, that sector of the coal uh, workers and there is a a just transition for Canadian coal power workers that that is uh, for very that very purpose and animal agriculture is very much positioned for this kind of transition as well the plant-based food industry is taking off I've never seen anything in my lifetime happen so quickly in terms of a a flip of a switch in terms of what's available in the market what consumer preferences seem to be leaning toward and just the impossible whopper at Burger King it's not vegans and vegetarians that are driving that demand. It's flexitarians who want to do something better about their diets. So what are we waiting for? The government can propel this transition. We shouldn't have to wait for individual sectors of the, uh, of the market to do it uh, for us. It's not gonna happen fast enough. And uh, Howard beat me to this, but I, as an American, I was pretty proud of myself to stumble on, on this article in the Winnipeg uh, Sun uh, while I was preparing this presentation. This is tremendously, hopeful in my view uh it's it's not nearly subsidies this is this is just federal financing but the fact that the federal government at least in principle is supporting a transition to to uh plant-based production is incredibly encouraging that is not going to happen in the u.s while we have trump and likely won't happen after trump um and hopefully that's just a few months away uh this is this is really promising that that canada is going to get to a transition to plant-based production as a way of doing business uh sooner than the u.s and hopefully the u.s will have a a good suit to follow and and get on the right bandwagon uh, uh as soon as possible i'm i'm looking forward to your questions and comments thank you again for your attention Thanks so much, Randall. We really appreciate that great informative presentation. So, uh, okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next invited speaker. Dr. Margaret Robinson is a Mi'kmaq scholar and a member of Lenox Island First Nation. Margaret works as an assistant professor at Dalhousie University, where she coordinates the Indigenous Studies program. And Margaret holds a Canada Research Chair in Reconciliation, Gender, and Identity, and she's interested in food sovereignty. So with that, Margaret, please take it away. Okay, uh, I'll start by introducing myself in Mi'kmaq, and then I'll switch over to English. So, Gwe Nindelewizi Muglish, Lewet Mi'kma'gi. Hello, my name is Margaret Robinson. I'm a Mi'kmaq scholar. I work as an assistant professor at Dalhousie University in Shibuktuk, uh, which is Halifax. I've been vegan since 2008, and I'm a member of Lenox Island First Nation. Uh, and I'm coming to you live from Mi'kmaq, at the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, and maybe later we'll get into why that is uh, a, a, an issue related to uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. So I'll briefly share two Mi'kmaq principles that I find helpful and say what I think they mean for our lives. The first principle is that everything is alive. And the second principle is that we're all related. The Mi'kmaq are sometimes described as having an animistic outlook, so from animated, um, which means that the world around us is seen as being imbued with sentient life. Not only animals, uh, but also plants, rocks, water, geographic formations like mountains and caves can be seen to have an identity, a personality, or a spirit. From a Mi'kmaq viewpoint, the earth around us is alive everywhere. Uh, this painting, Winter Caribou Number no. 2, is by Mi'kmaq artist Alan Silliboy, and I think it captures the perspective well. So you can see all the ideas here about how the Mi'kmaq see uh, the world as being imbued with spirit. Um, <clears throat> the second principle that guides me is an ulnu as a human being, is that we're all related. Mi'kmaq sometimes express this by saying uh, all my relations. 
I apologize, I do not speak Mi'kmaq. Uh, I've had to pick up my uh, traditional language in little bits and pieces. So apologies if you speak Mi'kmaq and I'm doing it poorly. Um, by all my relations, I mean that human beings are not seen as the only people. Uh, that is, we have those that Mi'kmaq elder Wanda Whitebird calls the people who crawl, the people who swim, the people who fly. Um, so there's this uh, broad sense of personhood, as opposed to, say, the kind that I encounter uh, most often in university philosophy. So if everything is alive, and if we're all related, what do we do about it? Uh, the Mi'kmaq attach personal and collective responsibility to our knowledge. So if something is alive, you treat it with respect. And this applies to all things, plants, animals, people, the planet itself. They have to be respected and everything on earth is connected, so no part should be exploited or abused. So if you've been brought up with these sort of principles, um, it's not difficult to determine that there's something very wrong with animal agriculture. Uh, this is the Sebaganagadi River. Uh, it's red because of the color of the soil. It's home to a number of fish, including herring, eel, shad, sturgeon, trout, catfish, flounder, smelt, perch, uh, and bald eagles roost in the nests around the river's banks. Uh, Alton Gas intends to create two salt caverns to store natural gas um, in this river uh, underground. So at full operation, Alton Gas wants to, tump, wants to dump 10 million liters of brine into the river every day. Uh, Mi'kmaq water protector Dale Poulette compares this plan to taking 10 boxes of salt and putting them into a 50 gallon fish tank uh, and expecting your fish to be okay. So Poulette and dozens of other volunteers built a protest treaty truck house on the Sabaganagadi River. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the Mi'kmaq nation pointed out to that they had not been consulted adequately on these plans and so that started another issue. Uh, indigenous resistance to plans like this that we feel are damaging to the environment and to our relations within it are increasingly being framed as, um, as criminal, even as terrorism. So this is a serious problem. Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall emphasizes that the Mi'kmaq value of Nedukalimk, uh, translated as sustaining ourselves, sometimes people call it sustainability, um, also sometimes described as gathering provisions, um, this value tells us how we should be relating with the world around us in terms of gathering the resources that we need to live. Uh, Mi'kmaq elder Carrie Prosper teaches that the words closer to the idea of avoiding not having enough rather than accumulating abundance. So this idea that we should always be trying to get more and more and more and that accumulating capital is a positive thing, um, not really an indigenous approach. Um, recently I read As We Have Always Done, which is a book by Michi Sagich Nishnebek, author Leanne Simpson. And Simpson writes, my ancestors didn't accumulate capital, they accumulated networks of meaningful, deep, fluid, intimate, collective, and individual relationships of trust. And although Simpson's from a different nation than mine, uh, her words resonate for me. And so I think when we when we approach the world as built of relationships of trust with different types of beings, uh, it helps us make better decisions. Simpson's emphasis on relationships also resonates with my view on the peace and friendship treaties, uh, which form the basis of sharing this territory. The 1752 treaty applies to the people who signed it and to their heirs and the heirs and their heirs forever. So we're talking about relatives, we're talking about our relations. And if we're going to keep the treaties, we need to acknowledge that when indigenous people, when the Mi'kmaq talk about our relatives, we're not just talking about the people, we're talking about all our relations, which includes the animals too, and about respecting them. And so I think we haven't yet fully developed the extent to which uh, treaty agreements imply particular relationships and responsibilities of respect to animal participants, as it were, in the treaties. Reconciliation in Mi'kma'ki is about this relationship of peace and friendship between the settlers and the Elno, but I think it also requires that we have to make peace with the land itself. Our philosophy in Mi'kma'ki asks us to make decisions with the next seven generations at the forefront of our mind. 
So by focusing on shared values rather than our different practices, I feel like we can unite on issues that affect the web of life. And uh, that's good because we and all our descendants uh, depend on that web. Um, I'll stop there. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So I'll thank you for your time now and uh, say walaliak, which is uh, thank y'all, uh, and the multis, which is uh, see you later. Awesome. Thank you so much, Margaret. That's fascinating. My pleasure to introduce our third invited speaker, Nathaniel Erskine Smith. Nathaniel has been elected since 2015 as the Liberal MP for Beaches East York. He is a strong animal advocate in Parliament, introducing and supporting legislation to protect animals. And Nathaniel is co-founder and now chair of the Animal Welfare of the Liberal Animal Welfare Caucus. So thank you, Nathaniel. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you. So first, I just want to thank everyone at Nation Rising for making today happen. And I know you would prefer to be on Parliament Hill, but I think it's still really important to come together and, and to make this happen. I also wanted to take a moment and just to remember and recognize Regan Russell. I mean, we, it's hard to accept that we just lost someone in the animal rights movement who is bearing witness to animal cruelty that day as many times before and lost, uh, lost Regan mere days after Bill 156 uh, became law. And so it's, um, it's a real challenge. And I think hopefully it's, we, we see people rally around Regan. I, I was, uh, you know, it was hard to read her, uh, her husband's comments in the media, just to, what, what a loss. And so I, I hope that we all work so much harder to, towards um, a more compassionate society for, for others, including for animals. Now, in the last parliament, we saw progress in an, on a number of different fronts. And I was glad to see presentations today focused as much on the environment as on animal agriculture and, and speaking about the importance of tackling animal agriculture, but also tackling climate, you know, climate change. And we have made progress in many respects, including for animals, but I would say it's clear enough we haven't made enough progress. And so when we look at the action on the climate, we see an important phase out of coal-fired electricity by 2030. We see important rules for methane uh, reduction. We see important rules for investing in public transit and investing in clean energy. And we see the price on pollution and an escalating price on pollution, but we don't actually see animal agriculture as a significant piece of that climate plan in a way that it ought to be. And we, on animals, we see in the last parliament important action to strengthen the criminal code modestly, but, but still importantly, we see important action to ban the, the shark fin trade and to ban cetaceans in captivity. We see some important movement on, uh, on humane transport, though very limited. And so again, we didn't see, we saw some movement and I was glad to have introduced a bill that helped move some of these issues forward. But we again, don't see animal agriculture as, a, as enough of the picture with two caveats, I would say. And so we see the Canada Food Guide and, and I, I think that's gotta be alongside sustainability policies and, and our climate obligations and our, we're only going to see our climate ob obligations become more stringent and so, those twin policies of food and of climate have to be tied together and we do we I think it necessitates and it will necessitate for any reasonable policy maker and and you know uh, administrative officials in, in departments and ministers offices it will necessitate seeing agriculture as an important tool to address both of these important policies that are now our our policies the Canada Food Guide is federal government policy and we have sustainability policies on the books as well which we, we have to take seriously. Now we've seen beyond the Canada Food Guide as a document we've seen 153 million dollars in the last parliament for a super cluster related to plant-based protein. Just recently we saw another 100 million dollar 
investment in merit, again, a plant-based investment and protein investment, largely because frankly, uh, this is where the world is moving. And, and so we want to support Canadian farmers in getting there. Also, we have an incredibly strong uh, pulse farming sector here in Canada. And I think there's a, a focus on developing that further. Now, how can we do even more? And so I, I want to touch on two elements here. And, and I, I think absolutely Nation Rising's focus on subsidies is an important one. And so calling for greater federal spending, whether it be in plant-based uh, proteins as we've seen, or whether it's in cellular agriculture. And I know there's a, a, a nascent movement here in Canada growing out of the United States for cellular ag agriculture as well. And I, I don't particularly care which wins out in the end or some combination of the two, if it will be better for our environment, be better for animals. And uh, so we need to continue those public funding, public financing, public investments in the future. But we also need to operationalize the food guide by way of federal procurement. And so I think I, I, would, I would suggest to add to the list of issues when you're speaking to my colleagues and other elected officials, when you speak to provincial colleagues that you're focused on hospitals and schools, when you speak to federal colleagues, you're speaking to, we have a procurement minister that is very busy right now with PPE, but ought to be focused on how can we operationalize the Canada Food Guide and our climate policies through food pr procurement at the federal level. We spend an incredible sum of money feeding, whether it is in prisons or name the agency and the cafeteria in the agency, we spend a considerable sum of money as a federal government. And, and just as we have changed our procurement practices to address plastic pollution, consistent with our environmental policy, so too, we should adjust our procurement policies in relation to food to be consistent with the Canada Food Guide and to be consistent with climate policies. The last thing I will say is this is not going to be uh, an argument that is won over, overnight. I mean, despite the fact that we have such a strong foothold now with the food guide, the science-based food guide, the, the dire need to act on climate change and, and a, a recognition in this government, we now have a net zero target for 2050. We're gonna have a stronger target for 2030 at the next opportunity, obviously a little bit delayed because of the pandemic. But we, our policies have not yet caught up to those ambitious goals. And so I think it's really important to meet with my colleagues, members of parliament, to be a, a bug with, with ministers as well. and. I, th I think it's really important to have very friendly conversations because you, this isn't about ensuring that my government, our government adopts the, the goals we want to see. Largely the goals are there. It's now about saying you have identified these as your goals. Now act like it, these are your goals. And I would say that in meetings with my colleagues, regardless of party, frankly, that you are emphasizing those policies that are on the books and you're asking how is the federal government going to get there through food policy? And how, how have you looked at food policy as a vehicle to getting us towards operationalizing the food guide and getting us closer to our climate targets and where we need to be? And I would treat it as an ongoing conversation. That this isn't, I've met my member of parliament, I tick the box and uh, you know, I come back and I say, you know, job well done. Hopefully they change things sometime in the future. The best, the best advocates in my constituency and beyond on different issues are the ones that build a relationship with me and that check back in every three to six months that develop, whether it's petitions in my office that are getting involved and engaged in a more serious way and don't just see the obligation to meet once and then I've done my part. And if it is just about taking a meeting, then it's about making sure that there's a regular meeting every six months or a year to check back in and build that relationship with your elected representatives so that you can have a stronger voice. And with that, I, I just wanna thank all of you for your advocacy. In the end, so much depends upon a small number of people and it is really important the 
very strong voices that are here today in ensuring that we continue to see progress and that we see faster progress on the way outside of this pandemic for the sake of our climate, for the sake of our health, and for the sake of animals everywhere. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Nathaniel. Really appreciate it. Very informative and really, I think, helpful proposals for, for action as well. All right. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our fourth and final invited speaker, Renee king Sonnen. So Renee was born and raised in Houston, Texas, before moving with her husband, Tommy, to their Arlington, Texas ranch in 2009. There, Renee fell in love with all the farmed animals, and after witnessing their treatment in animal agriculture, she went vegan and created an animal sanctuary out of what was once a beef cattle ranch. And since making this transition herself, Renee has been determined to bring more farmers into the animal rights movement. And as founder of the Rancher An uh, Advocacy Program, the Rancher Advocacy Program, Renee has been working with other farming families to transition them away from animal farming. So Renee, welcome and we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Howard. And hello, Jenny, Darlene, Dan. It's good to see everybody, uh, all my friends in Canada. Um, I still, you know, have the heartbeat and the memories of marching in the streets um, with the nation rising and going to parliament with you guys. And that is still so much a part of, uh, you know, my soul, it made a big impression on me. You guys rock. And uh, thank you for asking me to uh, speak today. Uh, we've come a long way, you know, uh, in 2009, like Howard mentioned, I moved to uh, the ranch in Angleton and I had no idea that my life was going to forever be changed once I began to see uh, the animals in the pasture, the cows that uh, were never even uh, noticed by me until Rowdy Girl, a baby calf, came into my life. And when Rowdy Girl came into my life and I began to bottle feed her, I uh, wasn't vegan, but I began to have um, a awakening. It was a spiritual awakening because for the first time in my life, I began to see through the eyes of a baby calf all the other animals in the pasture are her kin, and they were all like me. They just looked different. They all loved their families. They had eyes to see, they had ears to hear, they had a heart to feel, and they were so, so awesome. I began to have very conflicting feelings. I was a cattle rancher's wife, didn't want to do what we were doing, but felt I have a trapped force into a world that I had no idea how to get out of. Um, I didn't have a vegan advocate shouting in my face. I had nobody waving a sign. I had no uh, protesters, you know, uh, on my doorstep. All there was, was Rowdy Girl. This baby calf transported me into a dimension where all beings are one. And I began to see for the first time in my life that I had to do something for these cows in that pasture. I wasn't even vegan, y'all. I just knew I had to do something. I didn't know what that something was, so I began to challenge my husband. I began to ask him things like, why aren't we eating our own animals? How come we send these animals to the cell barn and we buy meat from the supermarket and these are the kind of questions my husband didn't want to answer. A lot of cattle ranchers don't want to answer the hard questions. They just want to do the job. They just want to take care of the animals, do what they got to do to get to the end of the day, to get the money, to keep, to be able to be on their land, to be able to pay their taxes, to be able to pay for their equipment, to be able to do what they got to do. But I began to pressure my husband and he began to answer me even though he didn't want to. And I would hear things like, well, Renee, if you must know, I can't eat animals that I know. And I was like, well, there's really something wrong with that. Although my answer was not calm, I began to uh, go a little frenetic and crazy over the fact that I was in an industry that I felt like I was contributing 
you know, to the deaths of all these animals and I was accepting the blood money. We were living off this money and I began to realize that when I put these animals in that trailer and I saw them go up the road, that I was sending them to their death. That it was, all that was on my back because I knew something was wrong. I knew I had to do something, but I didn't know what to do. Who am I, a Texas girl, you know, right slap dab in the middle of cattle country, what can I do about this? Well, these questions kept spiraling. I kept asking one question after the other. I, I eventually began to uh, <clears throat> ask my husband, I said, well, you know, if we're gonna do this, then we're gonna just go ahead and kill one of our own animals and we're gonna eat our own meat and we're gonna stop sending the animals to the cell barn. Can you do that? Well, he didn't want to do that. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, Renee, I, I, just, I just can't do that. I said, well, by golly, if we're gonna be cattle ranchers, you know, then that's what we're gonna do. And so I pushed my husband and he said, okay, Renee, who's it gonna be? I said, no, you tell me who it's gonna be. And so he picked one, his name was Lucky. And Lucky is still with us. He was lucky a couple of times. He was lucky he didn't get slaughtered. And he was also lucky that he missed the, the red trailer the last time my husband sent all those cows to the cell barn back in February of 2014. In February of 2014, the last load of calves went to the cell barn. I remember watching those animals as they left our pasture. I remember the mamas crying. I remember the babies feeling scared, their eyes bugged out of their head and betrayed. I remember feeling like I was responsible. When I heard those mamas crying day in and day out for their babies, I knew it wasn't because they just were just crying in the dark. They wanted their children. They had their babies ripped from them, just like you or I would be terribly betrayed. They felt completely hopeless. They would look for their babies. They would wail for their babies. And by God, that, that year of 2014, I don't know what happened, but something lit up in me. And I began to challenge my husband every which way but loose. October 31st, 2014, I went vegan. I didn't know I was going vegan. It wasn't a planned transition. It wasn't somebody, like I said, waving a flag at me or anything. It was always rowdy girl speaking to my heart. And on October 31st, I went to my mother-in-law's and she was, she was cooking beef stew. And that day I had watched Mary, um, I had watched Melanie Joy deliver a dissertation on carnism. And she was telling the story about a family that was having a big, big, big party and they were having beef stew. And she went on to serve this beef stew and everybody was enjoying it. And somebody at the table says, what's the recipe? And the lady of the house said, well, you start off with a pound of very young golden retriever. That moment on October 31st, there was like something cracked in me finally. There was a, a sunlight, some kind of something went inside of me and shook me up. And I was like, I could be eating my grandma's rear end and not know it. I mean, I could be eating chopped up, you know, the leg of whatever and not know it. Who knows what those little chopped up pieces of animal flesh in a bowl really are? Do we? Do we even know what that is? And so I began to think like this. That day and that night, at my mother-in-law's house, she was serving beef stew. And boom, a light bulb went off. And I said out loud to the whole family that was filled with all these kids in their Halloween costumes getting ready for a big block party. I said, I just can't eat that. And my mother-in-law says, well, why not, Renee? And I said, because it's got floating, dead, hacked up animal bodies in it, and I can't eat it. And the whole room went quiet. They looked at me like I had lost my mind, like their mouths fell open and they looked at me like, what did you just say? And I said it again. It's got floating, dead, hacked up animal bodies in it. Can't you see that? 
And my mother-in-law said, well, Renee, you can pick it out. And I said, no, ma'am, there's no more picking it out for me. That moment, I went vegan. The door slammed shut on my past and I became my husband's greatest nightmare. Here he is, a Texas cattle rancher, and his wife had gone vegan, and I was forbidding him from sending any more animals to sell. I threatened him on every turn. I told him if he sent that trailer up the road one more time, I would follow him, and he knew I meant it. I said to him, I will follow you, I will follow them, I will go to the cell barn, I will buy them all back with your credit card, I'll bring them back home. Try me. And I meant it. He knew I meant it. And he said, stay out of my blankety blank, 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 blank business. I said, nope, not a business. No more. This isn't a business. These are family members. These animals I began to see for the first time were my kin. They were my kin. They were my family. And it was my job to care for them. Well, needless to say, <clears throat> long story short, uh, I told my husband, I said, look, you know, if you're going to sell your cows, sell them to me and let me buy them. Well, he didn't think I would or could, but behind the scenes, I was building a coalition of vegan friends on a, on a page called Vegan Journal of a Rancher's Wife. I had started that page at the urging of my friend, Jeannie, who said, Renee, you need to just get out there and tell everybody you need help. Get, you know, get, get everybody on your side. And so I started doing that and I started getting more vegan friends than I even knew was out there. I didn't have any idea there were vegans out there that would help me. Uh, so I started reaching out and lo and behold, I began to attract the folks like Kip Anderson. You know, I was talking to Howard Lyman. I was getting, you know, Gene Bauer on the phone. By God, I was going to do whatever I had to do to save these cows. I didn't know what any of it meant, except I knew I didn't want them to die. And so I uh, started a fundraiser. Uh, I raised $36,000 in less than four months and I bought my husband's herd of cattle. And I started the first ever beef cattle ranch conversion that I know of in history. We're the first one that actually uh, had a herd of cattle and turned it around to become a vegan farm. And from that has stemmed uh, what was the catalyst of what is now the Rancher Advocacy Program. Because see, our story went viral. We've been on CBS Evening News. We've been on ABC More In Common. We've been in Southwest Airline Magazine all over the country. We've been on um, uh, Animal Planet. We've been in, on Live Kindly. We've been on you know, One Green Planet. I can't even tell you how many, you know, 60 or 70 news outlets, medias, you know, and, I, and because of that, our story landed in the laps of common everyday farmers. They would hear me and Tommy tell our story. And, and just like a wall got broken in on me, they began to hear something because it wasn't a vegan waving a flag at them. It was a freaking cattle rancher that was vegan saying these things and they could hear it. And so they began to contact me and I began to have conversations, just real conversations with them. See, I don't judge cattle ranchers. I have no part of the term beef with a cattle rancher. I have, I have no problems with them because I know who they are. They are people that just want to do what they think is the right thing. And unfortunately, they just ain't woke up yet. That's my Texas way of saying, they just need to wake up. And so, you know, so I, I just do what I, what I can. I'm there for them. And one day, one of our associates said, Renee, it's time for you to, to develop a program at Rowdy Girl. And you need to really think about that and pick something that's going to really resonate with your followers, something that's different that nobody else is doing. And um, I said to her, her name is Nikki. I said to her, I don't know, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, and she says, well, what do you do that's different? You know, not just, not just another program. What do you do that's different? I said, well, I talked to cattle ranchers. And she said, tell me more. I said, I told her, I said, well, you know, I don't really talk about this much, but I'm, I probably talk to a cattle rancher or their wife once or twice a week. They just call me up, or send me a text or message. She said, well, therein lies your program. Let's talk more about that. And so from that, we started doing a lot of writing and the Rancher Advocacy Program was born because I realized 
that I was not only an animal rights activist, but I was a rancher's advocate. And that has enabled me to be a bridge between animal rights and ranchers. And what we are doing is uh, right now, currently we are converting uh, the Barrett family farm in Wicks, Arkansas from a chicken farm, cattle ranch to a mushroom farm. Um, you know, if you want to get on my YouTube channel and see that four minute video that Mercy for Animals produced, you know, please do that. All you have to do is Google Barrett Family Farm um, Rancher Advocacy Program and you, and you can watch it. Uh, they, used to, they used to process 100,000 chickens every 52 days. They have 240 cows right now in their pasture that the Rancher Advocacy Program saved through the foundation that works with us. So we were able to save their cows. We now have the funding in place. It's, we've managed to secure over a million dollars to fund this farm transition, the first ever of its kind in the world. And you know, I don't have any pride about any of that. In fact, what I have is so much humility, so much um, just gratitude that I'm able to experience this type of metamorphosis, this type of change in my lifetime. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a real, real mission because see, we have a real problem, y'all. If we're gonna change the, the, the landscape of animal agriculture, if we're gonna rescue farmers from all this uh, mess that they're in, we have to give the land back to the animals. And if we're gonna give the land back to the animals, we gotta have land worth giving, it, giving them to. And right now the land on our, freaking, on our freaking earth is terrible. We have horrible land. Uh, we have depleted uh, oceans. We have you know, forests that are burning up. And you know these animals are confined in filthy, horrid conditions. I just can't believe what we have done to our mother, our earth. And it is my mission to figure out a way to give these animals back to the land that they deserve. So one of the things we're doing is we are figuring out how to create a cow sanctuary pomaculture land trust. We are looking for folks that will help us get land so that we can dedicate it to the one sole purpose of putting animals like the Barrett family farm, the ones that are ending animal ag, giving them a place to go so that we that care about the earth can, can modify, we can fix the soil, we can fix the earth, we can bring back indigenous grasses, you know, shrubs, plants. They're, the, the world, the, the earth is ready to be right for the right solutions. We just have to be willing to do this. You see, we can't end animal ag, y'all, unless we fix the planet. We gotta fix the earth. How you, what are you gonna do with all these animals coming out of animal ag? What are you gonna do with uh, 500, 1,000 cows if a cattle rancher goes vegan? What are you gonna do? Send them to slaughter and say, hey, come on, get, come on back to me and tell me all about it once you get that done? See, I am in a real fix here. I'm trying to find right now a way to take 200, two, at least 200 of these cows. I gotta find a home for them. I'm talking to some folks. And if any of you out there want to be, want to be helpful, please email me at renee at rowdygirlsanctuary.org. Renee at rowdygirlsanctuary.org. I will send you the letter I'm sending to everyone else. Because if you have people that you know where you can help me make a difference for the lives of 200 cows, then let me know. I will send you that letter. Because this, the Barrett Family Farm is just one farm. There's going to be another and another, and we could end animal ag all day long, but until we figure out the tough problems, until we fix this, you're gonna be in a bigger problem. And I'm just here to tell you, as much as I love, love, love the vegan movement, don't get me wrong, we just wanna be all idealistic about ending animal ag, well then what? Well then what? 
I love you guys. Y'all, we're going to have a summit. We were going to have a summit in Austin, Texas in September, but COVID put an end to all that. Uh, October 31st, November 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th, we are going to be sponsoring a five-day RAP online summit. You will be hearing all about it. We already have six sponsors, Mercy for Animals, Miyoko's, Veg Fund, Jane Unchained, V Dog, and uh, there's one other one. I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but there's six. And if you'd like to sponsor this event, if you'd like to get involved, again, email me, Renee at rowdygirlsanctuary.org, and you will be seeing more about it in the coming days. And guys, I really appreciate y'all. Become a member. Help us out. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Renee. We really appreciate it. It was very powerful. And yeah, I hope a lot of folks will follow up on those uh, ways of getting involved with Rowdy Girl. So this is uh, Darlene's presentation on lobbying in Canada. We're going to cover what uh, what is effective lobbying and why it's effective, rules governing lobbying in Canada, Nation Rising's current lobbying efforts, uh, the plan next steps to increase lobbying, and a call to action. All right, so the definition of lobbying. So lobbying is the process through which individuals and groups articulate their interests and press them upon public office holders, federal, provincial, and municipal government members in order to influence public policy. Any person or group who attempts to influence a public policy decision is engaged in lobbying and may be considered a lobbyist. Professional lobbyists are paid to assist others to represent their concerns to government. And lobbying for broad policy change is a time-consuming and expensive business, often taking many years to accomplish. But lobbying is a major driver of political advocacy and policy change. And lobbying is effective as it provides a framework and solutions to allow politicians to make decisions so the hard work can actually be worth it. So the rules governing lobbying in Canada, paid lobbyists have to register with the officer of the commission of lobbying and provide regular reports. Paid lobbyists have to adhere to the Lobbying Act, revamped in 2008, and the Lobbyist Code of Conduct. Lobbying, uh, lobbyist activity can be investigated and lobbyists can be subject to criminal charges if they violate these rules. And members of parliament, the senators and their employees and senior executive public office holders can't lobby for five years upon leaving office. So Nation Rising's current, current lobbying efforts include MP meetings that uh, started in the spring of 2019 and have continued into 2020. And these are wonderful, but we need more. And as Nathan was covering, these can really have an important impact, especially if uh, they're not just a one-off, but a prelude to further engagement. So uh, the first attempt at lobbying day in June 2019 coincided with nation, the Nation Rising March and Rally on Parliament Hill. And the first letter campaign was initiated in fall of 2019 with less than 5,000 letters sent. So our uh, future lobbying plans include engaging a paid lobbyist by September 2020, um, through a, which we're hoping to finance through a GoFundMe campaign. Uh, we're hoping to implement a third letter campaign in the fall. And uh, we're hoping to support chapters to facilitate engagement of members of provincial parliament in our lobbying efforts as well. So there's, because um, actually when, when I was going over the, the role of, of subsidies, I was talking primarily about the federal government, but in fact, there's an awful lot of, of federal provincial partnerships and an awful lot of stuff that can go on at the provincial level, which might be somewhat, somewhat similar to what Randall was talking about in the United States going on in, in Colorado. Um, so calls to action. So we have some of these for you today. So the, the first one we've kind of gone over, but if you haven't yet done it, or if you can get your, your friends to do it, assignment one is to participate in our Twitter storm today. We, uh, assignment two, so please continue sending our letter to your MP asking to transition, uh, sorry, asking to have funding in the next federal budget to finance the transition to a uh, plant-based food system, a just transition to a plant-based food system. So to date, we've got over 6,000 letters sent, and this campaign is going to end in late August, so still plenty of time to send your letter. If you haven't done so, try to get your friends to send them, try to post about it and get others, others to send them too. 
And then assignment three, very important. If you haven't yet done so, schedule your first meeting with your MPP and your MP, uh, uh, sorry, with your MP, your member of parliament and your member of provincial parliament and use our materials, our lobbying documents, which we've got available on our website to make your case. Uh, we've, I, some of us here in Alberta, we've actually been handing these out to folks who seem interested uh, during street activism and encouraging them to, to meet with their MPs. Uh, you can meet with, and, and importantly, as Nathaniel was talking about, you can meet with your uh, member of parliament and member of provincial parliament more than once to discuss our movement, progress, and demands. As Nathaniel was talking about, that actually is highly desirable, right? That's how you can really build those uh, relationships and, and really have an impact. So that's, uh, that's it so far. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, to get further involved, please go to the website, Nation Rising, follow us on social media, and feel free to, uh, to send us emails as well. I did want to mention at the end, uh, we are trying to hire a professional lobbyist, and we are going to start a monthly giving program so that, um, so that activists and Nation Rising supporters can help us make that happen. So, um, and if you are able to give $10 or $20 a month to help us make that happen, you can do that at, nation, at our website, nationrising.ca. And we'll be implementing that soon and, and, and pushing it out. And we'll be sharing information on our lobbyist and all of the things that we're going to be doing very shortly. And just a thank you to everybody and for Howard for running this and to all of the amazing speakers and all of the supporters. We're so grateful for you. Thanks so much, Jenny. We really appreciate it. Please feel free to contact us if you have questions or, or want to get more involved. And thanks everyone for coming out. Take care. See you. Thanks a lot.